This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. You may be seated this morning. Robin and I this morning are going to be talking to you about raising babies and, and raising kids. And you say, oh God, I had to come on a day where they're going to talk about parenting. But let me just tell you this. I don't think it's by mistake Michael's saying that you are sons and daughters. And, and the things we can learn today also affect us in our Christian walk. So Robin and I are just going to share from our heart about the next 30 minutes with just our, uh, our parenting and what we've done with kids I had somebody ask me not long ago, they said, how did you and Robin get successful at, uh, at, at parenting? And so let me help you. How many of you know success is just whatever you want it to be? My, my teacher told me one time, he said, if you want to be successful, throw a dart on the wall, draw a bullseye around it. You'll be successful. But you, you, to understand the definition of success, I want to tell you what it is for me. Maybe for you, success is your kids don't go to jail. Whew. Maybe success is they go to college. Maybe success is that they make the dean's list. Maybe success is that they get married and have a good life and buy a home and don't have a lot of debt. Maybe success is they don't kill you. <laughs> so I don't know where your line of success is, but I distinctly remember when Robin came to me and told me she was pregnant with our, our first daughter, Olivia, I was tormented in fear about being a father. Would I be a good father? Would I show my children, at that time I didn't know she would be a girl, but would I, would I show my kids the things of God? And I, when we found out we were pregnant, we got a world of people who were, um, how shall I say, a world of people who gave us advice. And we had our own advice too. Our own advice is when we saw other people in, in Walmart giving their kids suckers, we would say, oh, there's no way I'll ever do that. We... <laughs> We were brilliant at parenting when we had no children. And then after children came along, I'm like, give them a sucker. I don't care anything to shut them up. Give them an Oreo, I, you know. Uh, so we ended up with four daughters. We have a 23-year-old, a 21-year-old, a 17-year-old, and a 10-year-old, all girls. So I feel highly, highly qualified boys. If you need girl advice, I have a lot of it. So if you're a guy in the room, you need girl advice, been there, done that, I'll help you the best I can. Uh, but success for me um, in raising all daughters, and that's a challenge when you're the only man in the house. Amen to men? Come on, men. Nobody wants to say anything to me. I'm not saying a word. Um, Adam, Adam was walking in the garden with God one day, and he said to God, hey, would you tell us the story of how you how you made me and Eve. He said, I, I want to hear it. And so God said, okay. He said, I'll tell you how it goes. He said, well, for you, I scooped down in the dirt and I fashioned you into a body and then I leaned down and I breathed into your nostrils and you became alive. And Adam's like, oh, thank you so much. I just love what you did for me. Thank you. He said, well, what about Eve? What'd you do with her? He said, well, I did something a little different. Well, what'd you do? He said, well, I scooped down in the dirt and I made her dirt, and I fashioned her body just like I did you. And what happened? He said, I breathed into her, and she became alive. And then what happened? He said, well, she didn't like her hair. So I scooped down again, and I punched her up with a bunch of dirt, and I fashioned her again, and I breathed into her. She came to life. What happened then? She didn't like her hair again. God, what'd you do with her? Oh, I... Got with heaven and we sat down and we came up with another plan. We fashioned her again. We made her as perfectly as we could. Breathed into her the breath of life. She came alive. What would she say? She didn't like her hips. Oh, so we got together in heaven. We got, the, we got the sun, the spirit together. And we decided to do it totally different than we did you. Well, what would you do? He said, well, we put you to sleep. We reached into you. We got a rib out of you. We fashioned her out of a rib, out of your rib instead of dirt. And then she, we breathed into her and she came alive. He said, what would you do that for? He said, well, we wanted to know when she came alive, she could now blame it on you instead of us. So, 
<laughs> so men, if you ever feel like she blames you for everything, there was a reason. that it, God couldn't even make her perfect. So, so I want to talk to you a little bit uh, from my perspective, and then Robin's going to share about what success is for me as a daddy. I read a scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, and I think everybody knows it. It's when Jesus is walking to find his disciples, and I teach it a lot, but I think it is a profound passage of scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Jesus called to them, Matthew 4, 19, said, Come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. I think the old school King James says, Come, follow me, and I'll make you into something. I'll make you fishers of men. When I read that years ago, that became my success pattern for a parent. And this is my model of parenting today. My model of parenting was the model Jesus used to disciple people, and it was this. Come, my daughters, follow me. In other words, I'm unsuccessful as a father if I don't give my girls something they desire to follow beyond just go to school, go to college. There has to be something in me that makes them long for the King of Kings. You follow me. So my first success as a father was, was I living in such a way that I would make them jealous to want to know God. I knew I would fail. I knew I couldn't be a perfect dad. That was I tried, but, but that's just an impossible feat to be the perfect parent. Nobody in the room is going to be the perfect parent. But I knew that if I would stay on my journey with God, and I would follow God, even through my failures, when I would fail, or when I did something to hurt their feelings, it didn't ever bother me to go to them and ask for their forgiveness. Would you forgive me for failing you? Because I knew one thing about a parent. They... They could not ever ground me, but I could ground them. And I think that's sometimes unfair. I think it's unfair that we can take their phone, send them to their room, lock them in their bedroom, get on to them for failing grade in math, but then I'm failing as a father because I'm looking at porn, I'm not in my Bible, I'm screaming and hollering at mom, but nobody can take my phone, nobody can lock me away, and it becomes a real divisive household when you've got the father giving expectations to the children that he doesn't even place upon himself. And so the one thing I tried to do as a husband and a father is I tried to place the higher expectations on me and just knew if I could live it, that they would become old enough to see the authenticity of Jesus in me. So come and follow me, and then I, and this is what Robin and I are going to talk about today, I will make you into a kingdom purpose. That, that That's our success, I think, as a mother and a father. Our success is this. Does she and I live in such a way in our home, not just here in front of you, but in our home, do we live together in such a way with each other that it makes our children jealous to be made into something that is a kingdom purpose for their life? So that whether they go to college, whether they become doctors or nurses, or whether they play sports, that they always see, no matter what path of life I choose, the greatest path is my kingdom purpose. And no matter what path of life I choose to be on, there is a higher calling on my life, and it is my purpose with God. And to me, I think I reach a success as a father when my children find their kingdom purpose. I feel successful then. I've never, I hope my girls will, they're all sitting over there, so I hope they're not in agreement. I've never asked them to make all A's. I've never asked them to pass their tests. I'll share some of that with you. I've never asked them to be perfect. I expect them to be imperfect. They're humans. I'm imperfect. They, you know, I expect that. But in that, my desire, and I know Robin's desire, has been that she and I, would live our life as a husband and a wife, as a mom and a dad, in such a way it would make them jealous for the things of God and it would make them hunger more for God than hunger more for the riches of life on this planet. And we just want to share that journey with you today from, from the time we shaped them as young kids all the way through. And remember, it applies to everybody because 
it applies to our Christian walk as well from the time you're born again to the time you meet Jesus face to face. And we pray today that what we share with you is going to challenge you. It's going to equip you. It's going to make you a better Christian. Amen. Hallelujah. So let me pray and then Robin's going to come and begin to share. Father, I just say today as we share our hearts, as Robin and I share um, just what we've learned over the last 20 plus years parenting and what we've learned as a husband and a wife working this thing out together through successes and failures, I pray today that you would just equip us to say the right thing and all the stuff that could be said, but Holy Spirit, you would just guide our conversations to help every person, whether we're grandparents, whether we're single, whether we've had no children or not, that something we say would prick the heart of every person in the room, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. So, well, um, I, I think that we need to have our kids up here one day Ooh. talking about us parenting. I think that would be the truth of how we parent. Olivia's shaking her head yes, and my other children are like, no, don't ever give me a microphone. But um, anyway, I think that those would be good tips for you all. So um, I want to preface everything that we're, we're about to speak about and the things that we're going to discuss um, with the fact that um, although we although we're talking about things that we succeeded at today there are always a lot of things that we can all go back as parents and we can say gosh I wish I would have done this differently or that differently or I left this out and I, I left that out and all these ingredients that we try to put together to make the perfect child you know just to raise them up to be our ideal um, creation and so I just want to kind of lay a blanket of grace out this morning. Um, many of you have grown children and many of you may hear some things today that you look back on and you say, gosh, I really missed that. You know, and, and my child is paying the price or our relationship is paying the price or, or whatever. So God is a good God. He is a gracious God. And anything that we do that is imperfect, he sent Jesus for to fix, right? He sent Jesus who is the perfect. So I don't want anybody in here as they're listening to us to think, gosh, well, they, they did all that right and their kids are, you know, A, B, C, or D, um, and, and, and they've gotten good results from that. That doesn't mean there aren't things in our lives as well that the grace of Jesus has not had to come in and to sweep over and to cover. And I have conversations, my children, some of them are um, older older than others, obviously, and so as they age, you begin to have conversations with them that are very adult-like, and so they know as well things that we left out and things that we they wish that we could have done and should have done and, and all of these things, so I don't want us to sit here today living in the could-haves and the should-haves and, and all of the things that we didn't do, right? I want us to live knowing that God is good and that he is gracious and um, Maybe your children are grown, but that doesn't mean God can't heal relationships. It doesn't mean that he can't do a good work in your children. It doesn't mean that you can't plant good seeds, even in the lives of your adult children. And, of course, you, have, you may have grandchildren or nieces or nephews or things like that that all of this wisdom can, can very much be applicable to. So, um, well, I'm going to start in the beginning, right? Because that's, we're not given children as 25-year-olds. We're given children as babies. And as much as I would love to leave this point out, um, I, and I circled all the way around it. You know, I was like, nah, I don't want to talk about that. Everybody, when they begin to talk about children, always land here. Um, but it, it has worked for us, and I just could not escape it. If you're going to raise children who, like Mark prefaced, uh, are speaking on, if you're going to raise children who have a purpose for the Lord and, and who know who they are in Christ and have a relationship with Him, which is our goal as parents, then you are going to have to establish at a very, very young age what authority means in your home. So we're going to tackle discipline for just a minute. So, and I know you may have read books, and I'm, I know you may have, you know, uh, just, I, I know some of you may be over it and think I've heard everything that I want to hear about discipline, but you cannot, you cannot raise a child to know and to hear and to respect and to respond to the voice of the Lord in their life if they don't first know how to, under, how to understand and respond to the voice of authority in your life. And as you get them at babies, they're really not having these moments of intercession with the Lord. They're not laying on their faces prostrate. They're not fasting. They're not having, you know, just 30 days of solitude with them and Jesus. They're living in your house with you. And if they don't know how to hear you, they're never going to get to the place where they can hear them. So, and as sweet as babies are, we bring them home, and, and ours were all gorgeous and all beautiful, and they were 
with these sweet little bundles of pink. Who can be terrors. <laughs> that, that we brought home. Somewhere around, um, I don't know, 18 months maybe, um, all of the sweetness, somehow you just start seeing these little things that, that pop up where they're trying to assert their identity now, right? Because they're not just laying in a bed all day, sleeping and eating. They are asserting a will. They're, they're learning to assert desires. They're learning to express themselves. And all of those things, if not um, shaped, can cause you and them a lot of frustration in their life. Um, the book of Proverbs tells us that children who um, are disciplined can be a delight to your soul, that they can cause refreshing to come to you. And how many of you have seen or have been, maybe you don't want to raise your hand, that exasperated parent? Yeah, the, the parent that your child is running you ragged. Your child is calling the shots. You're exasperated. You're exhausted every night. You have zero control over your child. All of that points back to a lack of teaching them and instructing them and, and shaping them um, as it comes to discipline. And all of my children had, had one of these moments that I'm about to share with you. It just so happens, how many of you know you just always remember the first time, the easiest, right? So it, it may be a little bit pick on Olivia um, day, which is, you just always remember the first, and then by the time you get to the fourth, you hope you've worked out all the kinks, and, and sometimes you haven't, and you begin to create more kinks because you're exhausted, but um, anyway, so I remember this moment with Olivia. She was probably 18 months, and she had taken her clothes out of her, the bottom drawer in her dresser. We were in her bedroom, and we were playing, and um, just playing with stuffed animals and music and worship stuff and all kinds of things, and um, she just decided to empty the bottom drawer of her dresser. And so I told her to put all of her clothes back in the bottom drawer of her dresser. And all of a sudden, my sweet angel looked at me and said, no. And I mean, it was just as matter-of-factly, just as calmly. If she was just like, no. I said, Olivia, put your clothes back in your dresser. No. Put your clothes back in your dresser. I mean, it was... Um, it was the first time Mark and I had made a choice that we were going to use a spoon for spanking. So, and, and all of you, I, I'm not going to tell you um, exactly what you want to use. I'm going to say that the Bible does say that we're to discipline our children and that the Bible also does say to spare the rod or spoil the child, that whole scripture there. So I'm not sure what method you want to use. I don't know if you want to use timeout. I don't know if you want to use um, spankings. And, and I'm not here to dictate that to you, but I am here to tell you that the Bible is very, very clear on discipline. Very clear. So we had chosen to use a spoon. We had chosen never to use our hand. We wanted our hand to be a sign of blessing. We did not want them to be fearful of us or of our hand. We didn't want to reach out for our children and have them, you know, in any kind of way think that we would, would never be blessing them. And so we had chosen to use a spoon. So I had a little spoon that had a little smiley face on it. That <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that they knew. It was in my diaper bag, it went with me to restaurants, it was in my purse, and after a while you just don't even use the spoon, you just show the little smiley face and they get the point and life is good. So, and you were not exasperated. But this was the first, the first time Mr. Spoon had to come out. And you know that, that first moment that you're thinking, you know, all these things that you're wrestling with as a mother, you know, you begin to have thoughts of, do I really want to spank? Am I going to spank? Is it that big of a deal? I can put her clothes. I mean, how, how, how easy is it for me just to put her clothes back in the dresser? And um, 45 minutes later, I'm not kidding. 45 minutes later, I'm popping on the leg. Now, that's not a 45-minute beating, but that is, a, <laughs> that is a, a pop on the diaper, Olivia, put your clothes back in the dresser drawer. No. Pop her again. Olivia, put your clothes back in the dresser drawer. No. F I mean, 45 minutes of this. I'm sure there was, there was part of me that it was probably just put your clothes back in the dresser drawer. You know, because you're trying to determine you don't want to be abusive, you don't want to spank too hard, all of these things. I was in tears by the time this moment was over. And the reason I was in tears is because there was a battle of the will that was taking place in my home. And it was between an 18-month-old and a mother who had decided that she was going to spank. And I remember calling Mark on the phone saying, are you sure? Are you sure we're going to, to spank her? Are you sure that, that we can shape her and that we can mold her and that we can cause her, her will to do what, what we want to do? And he's like, yes, I'm sure. So 45 minutes later, Olivia puts her clothes 
in the dresser drawer. And we never had a moment like that again. There were, there were certainly no marks, anything like that. It, it was not a, an abusive moment, but it was a moment where I had to instill in my daughter at 18 months of age that life is not going to be done the way you want it, how you want it, when you want it, and how you say it's going to be done. And for parents who, who are scared to discipline, you are, you are allowing a child to make decisions and usurp your authority, and they will never be able to have a relationship with God because the truth is, as an adult, as an adult woman, as a 47-year-old woman sitting here today, life cannot be done the way I want it, how I want it, when I want it, delivered to me on a silver platter every single time I want it. If I am that kind of a woman, I am not going to be receptive to a God who tells me, Robin, don't do this. Robin, go here. Robin, lay hands on the sick over here. Robin, you're going to forgive. Robin, you're going to be kind to your husband. Robin, you're going to be respectful. I have a relationship with, with God where he expects me to listen to him. And I have a will that had to be subject to him. And children who are not subject to their parents, they have a will that, that has not been um, broken yet. And, you know, I, I'm trying to choose my words real carefully because I know we live in 2016, and I know that people can be very abusive. They can be very abusive with their words. They can be abusive with discipline. We see it on the news, and we see it um, in, in social media all of the time. So, so we... As, as Christians have to understand the value in teaching a child proper respect for authority. And it's no secret today that this generation, if they've lost anything, it has been respect for authority. And I get calls all the time. There's a, there's a group of moms here that, that I spend some time with, and I get questions all the time of what am I going to do? Am I going to hurt my child's personality? Am I going to squelch them by telling them no? How much power should I give them? And I'm telling you, between the ages of zero and seven or eight, it should be very, very minimal, <laughs> the power that they have to voice, to voice their opinion and their expressions and their identity and their will. Um, and that is not to say that you want to squelch those things as time goes on. And we're going we're gonna to begin to talk about how to shape them so that they can express their identity and their will appropriately to you. But a two-year-old telling you what to do and how to do it and telling you what they will or will not do does not produce a very um, productive citizen. It doesn't produce a very productive Christian. And so somewhere in your life of raising your kids, you're going to have to figure out how am I going to... Um, how am I going to conquer this thing of authority with them, and how am I going to show it to them properly? So that would be the first thing that I would say is that we have to instill um, authority so that you can enjoy life, so that you can go through Walmart and not have a child who's standing up in the, the middle of the aisle screaming, throwing ten temper tantrums. That's yeah. just not refreshing. I think this is what I came to as a father. Um, by the time your kid's five, he's she, he or she's figured you out. They know by five years old how to manipulate you, make you miserable, get exactly what they want at five. Uh, brilliant by the time they're three or four. And what God really put in my heart is that uh, at the early age of zero to three, probably, your children have to know yes means yes, no means no, there is no debate. So um, that's what God says about you. Let your yes be a yes. Let your no be no. And kids a lot of times are trying to figure out because I know with Robin, her yeses were like 15 of them. Her no's were like 15. Like, uh, okay, now I'm going to tell you one more time. All right, this is your last time. Okay, do you understand? Now I'm telling you, this is the last time I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do it one more time. Now that's three times in already. And so I would watch her go, okay, I'm going to one more time. And I said, honey, I said, they get one. Here's, here's my parenting philosophy. I think we've done well with it through the four. You get one warning shot over the bow. Click, click. <laughs> and it just goes over the bow like a warning shot. Turn your ship around or we're sinking it the next time. One warning shot. All of my kids when I come, you know, like Robin said, 45 minutes of going back and forth. And what I really worked on was one warning, and then here comes the discipline. 
And ours was we never, we never punished by sending them to their room, and we never did time out. Um, because I never saw time out in the Bible, so I thought, why am I going to try something God doesn't even try? So, um, so we, did, we did one warning, and then the discipline that comes with, did you or did you not obey? And out of that, um, myself as a parent developed this. It worked well. I would encourage you with it. It's John chapter 1. The Bible says Jesus is full of grace, and he's full of truth. If you're a parent that is just all truth, you're going to raise kids who become very embittered at you. I told you, you better make an A, and if you don't do this, and if you don't do that, and it's very just bang, 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 even in their teenage years, bang, 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 you better, you better, and if you don't, people are arguing, screaming, taking phones, cutting off internet, locking them in their room. Truth, you better do what we tell you to do or else. But if you're not a home that has grace, grace and truth, you will raise an embittered child. But if you're a home with all grace, meaning you never discipline, the kids always get their way because you feel guilty that you're going to crush their spirit and their soul and they're going to hate you and be mad at you and if you spank them, they're going to be upset, you raise up a spoiled, rotten kid. So either way, you get an embittered child or you get a spoiled, rotten child, and I don't know if you've ever bumped into either, but they can be a terror, right? Feel free to say something. Uh, so you end up, so what God showed me about discipline as a dad is that I would never spank my child. They all laugh at this to this day, and it is funny. But when I would spank them, and usually one, sometimes no more than two, pop them on the hind end, and, uh, and then I would take them in my lap and I would make them sit in my lap. Oh, they hated it. Pop, ooh, ooh, I hate it, I want to be, you know, just get out of my room. You know, kids don't like to be spanked. And I would say, now come here, you're going to love me. I don't want to love you. I would want to love a daddy like that. I don't want to love a daddy like that. Come here, you're going to love me. I don't, don't you, I don't want to love you. You're going to love me anyway. You have to love me. I'm your daddy. <laughs> you know, they can't talk. because it, And it's like you hit them hard. And you just kind of popped them on the hind end. But this really worked. I never left the room until my children had calmed down, sitting in my lap. So it typically went like this. Pop. <laughs> Come here. You're going to love me. I don't want to. Then I would get them in my lap. And, oh, they'd be like a board. Just... Just stiff as a board. Just don't even touch me. I hate being touched. And I would hold them. And I would just start singing, Tis so sweet to have this baby. She's so kind and sweet to me. I will love her every day. Doesn't matter who she'll be. And I would just sing something. And I'm telling you, it's the most supernatural, sovereign thing. Because immediately, the anger and frustration of discipline turned into a relaxed child whose little eyes would start rolling back in the back of their head, and almost before I knew it, they would be asleep in my arms, teaching them that I'm not here to just give you truth alone. I'm here to be a father of grace. And so as we developed our time and my children got older, I began, there comes a point in a kid's life where you have to begin to teach them how not to make decisions because they're afraid of you, but to teach them to make their own decisions. And so we move through life teaching our children how to learn to hear the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I did in discipline was days of grace and days of truth. You're in trouble. You're going to get a spanking. I introduced it to all of them at about age eight. You're going to get a spanking. Mom said you disobeyed. You talked back to her. I had the little spoon with a smile. I don't know why we put a smile on it. That's so deceptive. And um, <laughs> should have put cuss words or something on it. I don't know. And a uh, little smiley spoon. And then I would say this to them. I would say, but today I want to teach you a new concept. And they would say, what, Dad, Daddy? And I would say, well, you deserve a spanking. <laughs> no, 
I said, but I want to introduce you something that Jesus introduced to me, and it's called the day of grace. I said, that's where you need to be punished or disciplined, but I'm not going to do it just because I love you and I forgive you. And it's called a day of grace. A day of grace? I said, a day of grace. I said, that, I don't even get a whipping. No, not today. No, honey, because Jesus, and I would use this, and then over time, we teach them that they can pick a day of grace or pick the discipline. How many of you know every kid will pick the day of grace? Every kid picks the day of grace. So once the day of grace is picked, the next one is automatic truth. And then once truth is given, you get to pick again. And it has worked wonders with our children to raise children who understand the balance of grace and of truth. So I just encourage you to do that. And um, I, I, wanna, I wanted to talk just for a second right there about the balance between parents. Because um, so how many of you are rule keepers and rule makers? I'm a rule maker and a rule keeper and a rule follower by nature. So when Mark started doing the Days of Grace thing, everything in me was just like, ah, you know, you've got me now where I'm disciplining them, and now I'm telling you that they've done A, B, C, or D, and now you're like, I'm going to give them a day of grace. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, no. So, um, be because I'm a rule follower, and, and because I'm Beat your children! <laughs> beat your children! <laughs> Honey, I don't want to beat them! You haven't been with them all day! You've been at work! I've been with them all day! Come here, I'll spank you too! <laughs> So there, there are some things that God puts us with people who strengthen our weak areas, right? So, um, you know, I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm on a, a diet, like I am, if I'm really there mentally, the older I get, you really have to get there to, yeah. to really be there mentally. But if I'm in, I'm in, you know, 100%. So I'm not the one who I'm in, but, oh, I'm at the movie, so I'm going to eat a milk dud. You know, and, and, and Mark's personality is more... You know, he kind of fluctuates. I'm eating milk duds <laughs> even on a diet. Right. So, um, you know, so, so there's, there's the relationship as well of, of a husband and a wife and who God has put you with. And that can work good, and it can be a benefit for your children if you will let it. Instead of trying to make the husband be the mother, and instead of trying to make the, or the father be the mother, and instead of trying to make the, the mother be the father, it is good to allow your spouse to be who they are as a parent, and to glean from that, and to learn from that. I know some of us as mothers, um, how many of you have ever left town with a list of rules, okay, for the whole family. Because we're running the families, right? We're running the household. We know how it's done. They're at work during the day. We're home. We know how the discipline goes. We know the school schedule. We know the homework schedule. We know the laundry schedule. We've got it all down. So you go out of town to speak at a conference, and you have in your mind just this vision of what your home's going to look like when you get back, right? So you have in your mind of how orderly the children have been, that the laundry's going to be clean and put up and folded, and that um, all their grades will have been good while you're gone. So I would go on trips, and I would come back, and I kid you not, mattresses would be stacked on top of other mattresses in children's bedrooms where they had been playing jump off the twin beds. Right? Hallelujah. Yeah. So just these, and I'm thinking. It's like, girls, mom's gone. Yeah. So. Let's party! <laughs> Get the Oreos, call your friends! Exactly. I would come home to cabinets full of Pop-Tarts. Seriously, Pop-Tarts, things that I don't ever buy, Oreos. So, Daddy, you know, there, there was a part of me that almost would begin to think, I resent that. I resent that he's having fun. I don't have time to have fun, right? We don't have time to, to have fun like that with our kids because we always have to order things and we always have to have it set like it should be and you know we just have to keep this household kind of thing running but um there's a lot to be said of letting your spouse be who they are as a parent and um uh, of not trying to make them parent like you parent and not trying to make them into they they only need one mama they don't need two mamas and they only need one daddy they don't need two daddies and so i think um, i learned to appreciate those days of grace and learn to appreciate um those moments that he had with them one thing we did as a couple and I highly recommend this, is we never put each other down. Um, if, if mama said something, even if I disagreed in front of the children, I backed her 100%. And then we would talk about it later, because I think the worst thing to do is children know how to pit you against each other. 
They know which parent will say yes. That's why they'll be downstairs in the nursery today asking you something, and you'll say no, and they'll run up and ask dad. Dad will say yes. They'll run back down and tell you daddy said yes, and then you're like, Arr. and And it's a brilliant way to go. So I think a, ch a child understands personalities real quickly. You'll un uh, my children understand Robin's, and they understand mine. Uh, even the other night with Stella, I picked her up from the gym, and she just jumped in the car so happy. We drove home. I sing songs a lot and make up crazy songs. So I'm making up crazy songs. She's reading social studies to me in the back, and we're learning about the Missouri Compromise, and uh, we're laughing, and we're talking, and we get home. Oh, she's just as sweet and kind and wonderful. Door opens up. She busts in. As soon as she sees her mama, <gasps> I hate school. I don't want to go to school. Oh, God. They always Why? save the drama for their mama. Oh. Why do you make me even go to school? No mother would make their child go to a school they hate. What kind of parent would do that? No Christian mom would ever... I mean, this is true. Not, not even exaggerating. I'm not that exaggerating. Not really no true. Christian mother would ever make her kid go somewhere she hates. And I'm sitting there just watching Jimmy Fallon going, what in God's name is the meltdown? Uh, they understand parents. Uh, she, she knew she better not do the, that with me. And as soon as she saw Mama, she and I even tell Robin, she says, oh, Stella. And I say, honey, she just is working it. She's working it, honey. She's working. She said, does she treat you that way? I said, no. As soon as you go hiking, she's happy. I mean, we're out eating donuts, going swimming. She's just the kindest little kid. As soon as you come, I'm So know that about your children. They are brilliant at figuring your personalities out, okay? So it'll help you. Sell us the baby, and I need psychological help when it comes to the baby. That's why Ingrid's in my life. She's helping me out. So, um, all right, so we move from this place of discipline to, the, to they're getting a little older. And for Mark and I, um, remember how he started. Where we want to get them to is that, that they have an identity and a purpose and a calling that comes from God. And for us, that was primary. That was just primary in, in our parenting. And um, so we, we hit the junior high years, and... What we felt like we wanted to to raise were children who were, um, who who were not scared of us and could hear God. So we've moved out of this spanking stage, and now we're in this area where we want them to not wait to respond to our voice or our discipline, but we want them to respond to, to him. So there were times in our conversations with them that we knew that they had done A, B, C, or D. Um, but we would give them a little bit of rope. You know how you say give them a little, a little bit of rope and they'll either hang themselves or they'll you know, do something better with it. And so um, there were times with, with each of them and um, different stories um, come to mind. And uh, what comes to mind with me is Olivia had gotten a brand new bedspread. And um, when she got that bedspread, we told her, do not paint your fingernails on this bedspread. Do not. Whatever you do, don't paint your nails on your bedspread. So sure enough, we go out on a date, we come home, and there's fingernail polish on the um, bedspread. And she and her, her cousin had painted their nails on the bedspread. So obviously, I knew somebody had painted nails on the bedspread, right? So I could have just jumped down her throat or spanked her immediately or had a conversation with her. And I'm like, Olivia, there's fingernail polish on your bedspread. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> how it got there <laughs> just don't know so I said okay all right well we'll just figure it out you know we'll just figure out how it got there and so I left and ended up going to bed and um, probably I don't know 30 minutes later and all of my children have one of these stories so um, I, I could tell one about Sophia too but anyway I'm up in the room going to bed Mark's coming to bed and about that time I hear the pitter patter of little step little feet coming up up to my room and she came up there just weeping she said the Holy Spirit told me that I have to come tell you we just learned about the Holy Spirit and how he speaks to us and how he will talk and I couldn't lay down without hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit who told her that she had to come repent um, that she had lied and that she and Jessica had painted their nails and so that that's what you want as a parent and when that moment happens you then have another option you have an option to freak out because she lied. 
you have an option to freak out because she didn't tell the truth the, m the moment that you presented her with um, the problem, um, or you have a moment to uh, praise and instruct her on, on how important and good that was that she heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. So you have to also begin to create a balance of it's good you heard the Lord, and it is good that you responded to that. Now, there, there can still be a consequence for lying. There can still be a consequence for you disobeyed. But that consequence needs to be tapered and tempered to the fact that your child is learning to respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is always a good and beneficial thing. And all of our children began to enter into that age Age where they did, and even on the way to church this morning, um, which Sophia said, don't you think it's a little late to be asking now? I said, um, I said, Daddy and I are teaching on parenting today. I know we did lots of things wrong, but what are some of the things that we did right? And one of the first things that came um, out of Sophia's mouth this morning was, we always knew that if we were convicted about something in our lives that we could go to you and daddy and we didn't fear death we did not fear that moment of i'm about to tell on myself i'm about to let it all out i'm about to say you know everything that i've done that hasn't been great and what are my parents going to do and um at that moment you want to be sure that that you understand that that's a god moment for them that is a moment that they've heard the Lord, and so you need to be really careful how you handle yeah. those moments in their life. That, I'll end with this. It, this is an important part of, of raising children to know their prophetic kingdom purpose. Um, there is a point where God spoke to me that the best way to parent was, at first you have to be in front of them in their early years, giving them directions. Then when my girls hit 12 to 13, I felt in prayer, the Lord said, now I want you to be beside them and walk beside them. And then when they become adults, I want you to get behind them and support them. So about age 13 to whenever they move out of my house, um, I pretty much quit the discipline. Uh, unless it's just an extreme measure, they need to be disciplined. My goal as a dad is they have to learn to hear the Holy Spirit for themselves. If they don't, I've been unsuccessful. I have somewhat, so between 13 and 18, I've got five years to train them how to hear God for themselves, not because they fear Robin and I. So one of the things I teach my girls is, if you'll tell me the truth of what you've done, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you've been drunk. I don't care if you smoked weed. I don't care if you've slept with somebody, whatever it is. Whatever the thing is in your life, because I'd worked with teenagers so much, I noticed that teenagers would just vomit their problems to other friends, but they would hold back from their parents. And I believe the parent is the best person to help you. And so I said, look, if you'll trust me, it's trust. If you'll trust me as a father, you can tell me anything. And if you tell me first before I find out, I'm going to help you. If I find out without you telling me, there's discipline. Oh, and you ought to see that first moment when... He hasn't caught me yet, but I've done something wrong. Should I hold back and let him catch me and get in trouble, or should I come to my father and mother and say, I've done something wrong and trust that they will help me? And it works flawlessly. It works flawlessly to be able to sit down with your child who's struggling with a boy, who's struggling with self-identity issues, who's struggling with body issues, who's struggling with friends in general, and to sit down with them and they just begin to tell you their thoughts and their struggles, but they're not afraid to get punished. They're not afraid to get disciplined. They don't think their phone's going to get taken away. And they learn to trust that the kingdom of God in us is worthwhile. And we're going to teach you. So... With all of my daughters, I've got a 17-year-old now, and now we're working with Stella on this. I always bring them to this place at about age 17. I cannot keep making decisions for you. I cannot. You have to learn how to make them on your own and begin to pray. So, Daddy, what should I do? Honey, I need you to go to your bedroom and pray and come back and tell me what the Holy Spirit tells you about that boy. Can I date him? I've already told you what our rules are. I need you to go up there and pray. Daddy, what time do I need to be home from prom? I know what time. I need you to run up there and pray and tell me as a 17-year-old, what do you think the Holy Spirit is telling you is a good time to be home? If she says 1.30 and I'm thinking 1, then i got to determine, am I going to go truth and go, nope, you missed God 1, or okay, 1.30, grace, and I'm going to have to have some wisdom. 
But I'm going to be back at 11. Yeah, she's going to say 11. <laughs> and I'm going to say, honey, what teenager wants to come in at 11? Nothing happens in the city past 11. You know, it's nothing but whoredom and alcoholism. You know, I don't know. But, 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 the, beauty of, but the beauty of that is I would rather my daughter make a, a poor decision while still in the home of hearing God than just turn her loose off at college somewhere and nobody's ever given her a chance. Because I'm going to tell you this, parents, your children will fail you. Your children will miss it. Your children will make bad choices. Your children are going to flunk tests. And you just need to deal with it so that when my daughter called me, texted me last week, because remember texting is more than calling, she never calls, they just text now. So she text, said, Daddy, I made a 57 on an AP calculus test. I said, praise God, honey, that's smarter than me. I never could get into calculus. Sin, you know. <laughs> You made a 57, I couldn't even get into calculus. So, pff, you're smarter than me and mom both, and you flunked. Hallelujah for a good kid. Take after your grandparents on that one, you know. Versus beating her, taking her phone and all of that. I just said, well, honey, did you try? Yes, it's just so hard. Well, we'll figure out what to do. Don't worry. Uh, we'll help you. So I'll, I'll leave it with this. It's 11, 11, 15. I'll leave you with this thought. If you do not... Learn how to set the right footprints for your children. To train them to hear the Holy Spirit for themselves. Parenting is a hard road. It's a hard road. But I also want to encourage you with this, and I think Robin would testify, you're going to blow it. I blew it with my daughter Olivia one time. I lost it over Gatorade that was spilt all over me and the couch. You're going to blow it. The beauty is when you blow it as a parent, are you humble enough to go to your children and say, I blew it. And would you forgive me because I'm a father and she's a mom. And, and I just want to encourage you with this. She and I are here. I mean, I could talk about this forever. I mean, we've got 23 years of parenting here. It's hard in 30 or 40 minutes to grab a few of things to help you with. But we're here to help you. We're here to walk it with you, to share our successes and our failures. We would love to do it if you want to talk with us. I'm a Mexican eater. Feed me, and I talk a lot. So um, Robin has a B group that she's working with with ladies, so I, I know it'll be a blessing to you. Would you do me a favor and stand, if you will, and let Robin and I pray for you this morning. Believe that the Lord will just give you some strength. Hopefully something we said challenge you as a parent or as a Christian that it touched your heart. And we want to bless you today. Grab a hand of the person next to you, if you will. And let's believe that Jesus will just speak to us today. Our prayer teams are going to be up here to pray for you. Robin and I are up here. If you're frustrated in your life about parenting, or you may feel like, you know, my kids are already grown, but I feel like I may have blown it. I, 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 I'm just hurting in my heart that I may have missed great opportunities. No, you haven't. The Holy Spirit's still here today. He still works. You may say, I've blown it. Will I, will I ever get that testimony back? Don't worry, the Holy Spirit's big enough. He can work it out for you. He can give you strength. And for all the new mom and dads, here's my best advice. Grab you somebody that's been successful and follow their pattern. That's what worked for Robin and I. We found a, a, a couples, uh, two couples that were very successful, we felt like. And we, we mimicked what they did. We found out what they did. We asked them what they did. And we just applied it. So, Father, today, Robin and I bless the house. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit over this house. Thank you that maybe just something we shared today out of our heart will help and will encourage and will bring strength to parents to trust you and to trust the Spirit. And now, Father, I pray for all the kids that you say follow and you'll make us into fissures of men, that the kingdom purposes of God over every family, over every marriage, over every mom and every dad would, would resound in our lives. And I thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. And you shout amen. amen. I love you. Thank you so much for coming again today. Bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you next week, Wednesday night, 715 for Believers University. Have a great day.